نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed our praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek refuge in him from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and I bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah the topic of this evening's presentation as was mentioned is fasting a way of life and this topic of course is most appropriate because of the fact that we are in the month of Ramadan the month of fasting and by this topic i intended or i intend to share with you some thoughts i had on fasting which i think we all need to reflect on i need to reflect on it and hopefully in our reflection it would produce action inside of ourselves which would later transform our fast into something which was in accordance with what Allah has intended for us from fasting in saying that i'm implying that perhaps many of us if not most of us are missing out on the essence of fasting that fasting for us has become a cultural tradition which we do every year we did in our countries the countries that we came from everybody shares in it it's a time of festivity nice foods etc etc but in terms of fasting having an impact a positive impact on our lives that we can say when we turn and look at last year's fast and look at ourselves this year and how our fast is going this year can we turn back and look at it and say i have grown from last year to this year there has been a tangible change in my personality my spirituality my character has there really been a change these are the questions which i ask myself and i think that you all need to ask yourselves because prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam informing us inma bu'ithtu li utamma makarima makarima al-akhlaq that i was only sent to perfect for you the highest of character traits told us in that statement that fasting <coughs> is intended to change our character so if we are not experiencing a change <coughs> then we are not achieving the actual goals of fasting there is something missing fasting is a yearly ritual a cultural habit a traditional practice these are the terms which are usually used to describe our fasting so much so 
that we find people who will fast in Ramadan but they don't pray they will not even pray but they will fast I mean I've met a number of quote unquote Muslims you know who fast and don't pray and when I ask them you know how can you fast or why are you fasting when you don't pray well they say well you know fasting is just once a year you know whereas prayer is like something you have to do every day every day every day you know it's, so fasting is a lot easier because you just do it once a year and then it's gone finished yeah. I met myself personally when I first came into Islam back in the 70s and uh, in Toronto I grew up in Toronto and um, people you know who were there most of them were immigrants like yourselves who were explaining different things about Islam to me and I remember one friend of mine a Moroccan very nice brother who was a good practicing Muslim he told me that you know back home in Morocco many of his friends I mean he wasn't doing this but he said many of his friends would break their fast with hashish they break their fast with hashish I mean, this is the this is the state. I mean, he was trying to explain to me this thing of culture and really what Islam is about and how you know to be aware of that. Why? Because you know people come into Islam they're very enthusiastic. With, you know, Islam should really make a person, and then they meet uh, Muslims from different parts of the Muslim world and they find them not matching up to the standard. You know, and it's sometimes it can be very devastating emotionally, you know, psychologically, spiritually. It can be very devastating. So he was trying to prepare me, you know, to be aware of these, this difference of the cultural practices, you know, this, so fast men become that in his culture. Muslims saying, for example, that we gain weight in Ramadan, you know, and for non-Muslims is a very shocking thing, you know, how you fasted for 30 days and at the end of that, you know, you step on the scale, you've, you know, gained uh, five, ten kilos. How is that? It seems to contradict, you know. How can you fast and lose and gain weight, you know? What happened to them? And especially because our fast seems so severe to them. You know, no food, no drink, nothing, you're not putting it. Because for them to fast, of course, fasting, the few of them that fast, the Catholics, that they have Lent. You know, fasting is, you give up chocolates, you know, you give up, this is a fast, right? You know, for one week. You know. So when they see our fast, they see this severe, uh, you know, no food, no drink. No, it's really harsh. You gain weight after all of that? How? You know, it's something very shocking. But you see, all of it is a reflection of this cultural aspect of the fast amongst us today. And when we go back to look to see what is it really that the fast was designed to develop I mean what is it that Allah really wanted from us in the fast we see it in the verse from the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayu alladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon O you who believe fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you in order that you would become pious in order that you would fear Allah Taqwa Taqwa is the goal of fasting and Allah says there that it was prescribed for us as it was prescribed for those before us pointing to the concept that fasting is not something unique in Muslim tradition in Islam as taught by the final messenger of Allah to humankind Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if one goes to the scriptures of the Christians and the Jews Exodus one of the books of the Old Testament considered to be a part of the Torah today 
Exodus 34 verse 28 it describes when Prophet Musa went to receive the commandments from Allah and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights he neither ate bread nor drank water and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant the Ten Commandments Prophet Moses Prophet Musa fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without eating any bread or any food or drinking anything a complete fast and you can also find in the New Testament which is the documents or scriptures which are followed by the Christians in Matthew 4 verse 2 describing Prophet Jesus and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards he was hungry this is showing that fasting was a part of the way of the prophets the sunnah of the prophets of the past of course this fast 40 days 40 nights complete fast mean there's no break in the fast Prophet Muhammad was reported to do the same kind of fast but he forbade us from doing it Wisal it is called Wisal this type of fasting is forbidden for the followers of the prophets permissible for them but forbidden for the followers because Allah provides sustenance for, for them as the Prophet Sallallahu explained you know in ways that we cannot grasp and we don't obtain for us to try to fast in this way we'd be dead after a few days you know so obviously it is not something to be prescribed for us so our fasting ends at sunset but it is a complete fast and which is showing that the fast which is practiced amongst the Catholics today is, is, a, is, a, is a shambles you know, fasting for them is nothing now it is you know, it is nothing of the way of Jesus. They claim to follow Jesus, but they're not fasting anywhere near what he fasted. But what this is showing us that this was the way of the prophets. Alayhi salam. And this is what they taught their followers. This is something Allah prescribed with the earliest of the prophets. The prophets fasted and their followers, their righteous followers also fasted. Fasting to develop, as Allah explained, from our times to their times, to develop taqwa, a consciousness of Allah. A consciousness which would lead us to righteousness. Because taqwa is the heart of righteousness. Consciousness of Allah is the heart of goodness. If it is missing, then goodness is like a body without a soul or without a heart. It's just a, sh a, a shell. It's not real. And this is why when you find non-Muslims, atheists, etc., who say, we are good not because we believe in a God, and there is reward for being good and punishment for being bad. We are good because we know that good is good. We can see, we understand that it is good and that's why we do this good. That's what they like to, to promote. This idea that their goodness is you know, beyond this issue of reward and punishment. God is you know, being over us. No, we, we are good because we know it is good intellectually we can see this is good so we do it the reality is that this good that they do without taqwa which they see is good they will do it as long as it is convenient this is, the, this is when you get down to the realities of it as long as it's convenient yes they will do it but when it becomes inconvenient that that good now is going to create problems for themselves then you find they're not going to do it or if they find around them everybody is doing bad and getting away with it they'll do it. then they'll do it also they'll do the bad thing because there's no real benefit in it anymore so they're good though they say it is 
because it is good. No, no. It's because it is convenient to do it. They will do it only Allah, as long as it's convenient. And you can see this in, in, in people's lives in general. I know my own personal experience. When I visited New York City in 1981, after there had been a blackout, the electric grid had gone down in New York City for about three years, three, three days, right? Three days, New York City. And of course, for many of you coming from Pakistan or India or Egypt or whatever, that's not unusual. <laughs> so it happens all the time because it's a big deal, right? Well, for New York City, yeah, it was a big deal. I mean, the idea of electricity gone in the city for three days, this is something unheard of. Well, what happened? I mean, I, I, I arrived there about two days after they got the electricity back on again. When I came into New York City, you know, went into Brooklyn, the Bronx, I was shocked what I saw. I was shocked. The place looked like Berlin after World War II. You know? <laughs> and the place was just in shambles. I mean, you could not find a store, you know, whose windows were not broken in. All of the stores were broken in, doors bashed in, everything. They were putting up, you know, wood, to, nailing wood just to stop people from uh, going in there afterwards. Because, and they were showing on television what was going on during those three nights. The three days, nothing was happening. The place was fine, why? Because during the three days, policemen were on patrol. And, you know, to be a policeman in New York, like here, I mean, you have to be at least 6'2". You have to weigh at least 260 pounds, you know. So you're like a gorilla walking the street there, you see. <laughs> nobody's going to, uh, you know, everybody's going to stay in line, right? Nobody's going to do any bad there, right? So, but now, once the night came, you know, police can't do anything, it's all dark, right? It's too, when the night came, then people came out of their houses. Not just men and robbers, no, everybody, the man, his wife, his kids, they're coming just smashing in the windows of the stores and getting the goods, you know, driving up with their cars, you know, station wagons just collecting them. This is Big time. You know, it's incredible, you know, the, the people had, you know, news people, people had photographed much of this in the night because they had cameras with lights and stuff. And again, people think, oh, it's the poor people. You know, poor people in the ghetto and this is people... Who no! They were showing, there were people driving down with their Mercedes Benz <laughs> coming, you know, from the suburbs, you know. Everybody was there at it. I mean, of course, the people in the Mercedes, I mean, they weren't going to the supermarket, right? Because that's where the common people are hitting supermarkets, grabbing goods and things like that. No, the people in the Mercedes, they were going to the fur stores, you know, grabbing, you know, minks and, you know, these expensive furs and jewelry. This is what they were going for. But the whole city was involved in mass looting. You know, this is the, the most civilized country on the earth here, right? So, you know, so called, right? Democracy, some, you know, civilization. And they went mad for three nights. Why? Why? Because this was the time when people felt, no, you can do evil and get away with it. No policeman is going to stop you or catch you or whatever, you know. So once that opportunity came, uh, the little girl up there, whoever she belongs to, can please just... Once the opportunity came for people to get away with bad, then there was no point in being good. No point in being good. That's the, the reality. Because this is because there is no fear of God there. No fear of God. And I know personally, you know, when I went to study in Medina, in Medina University, I spent six years there in Medina, and. I, when I first got there and I used to see these policemen in Medina right and uh, you know in Medina when the time for prayer comes they would close up all the stores and people would have jewelry stores and that you know and uh, you see gold and silver and people would just put a piece of cloth over it and go and pray okay. yeah? something of course which uh, you know you, you try to do that in any 
western city, you know, <laughs> your store is finished in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You'd see people walking out of the bank with plastic bags filled with money. <laughs> I mean, if you try to do that in New York City or Chicago or Toronto, I mean, you get a few steps out of the door and somebody has knocked you down and got, <laughs> got your money already, right? <laughs> and, I, you know, I was shocked to see the policemen there. They looked like Sample. cubs, cub scouts. <laughs> Not even boy scouts, yeah, but, but cub scouts. <laughs> Little guys. Big guns, you know, yeah. and the gun you would see there, they had paper stuffed in the barrel of the gun to make sure dust didn't come in, right? <laughs> so, no bullets in the thing. Yeah. <laughs> they would catch a, you know, somebody, something happened, whatever, they had to take away the criminal. The criminal was a big guy, you see, little, little, like a little boy walking away with him, and he would just go. <laughs> and the sense of security. Security, you know, that I experienced there, and many, you know, Westerners that I've known who've lived there, you know, expressed that. You know, they felt a sense of security there, which they could never feel in the West. In the, during the Gulf War, same thing. Uh, I was involved in uh, those who were given battle to the American troops, you know, after the Gulf War for, for five and a half months, you know, before they were all processed out of the country. Alhamdulillah, more than 3,000 of them accepted Islam. You know, in Dammam, in the one area where I was. You know, this is documented, not just rumors spreading. I put their names on computer and sent it you know, to the States to help to follow up for them. The point is, many of them had told me that you know, this is what they experienced, because they would come in from maneuvers. They'd come in late at night. You know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. They would be walking the streets. You know, and the store stayed open knowing that so many of these people were there. And they would be walking the streets at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And they didn't feel, you know, scared. I mean, because there are women among them and men. There's a number of female troops there too. And they, you know, they expressed to me this sense of security. I mean, normally you go into the middle of a city, any of the big cities in America, you know, past 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you walk in the, night, the streets by yourself. You know, you, you'd be walking and, you know, always checking your back all the time. You, know, you, can, you, can, you don't feel there's no sense of security there. But they experienced it. They said, you know, it's one of the things which caused them to really question, you know, what is it that has made this society this way? So, it is that sense, that sense of taqwa, even though, and it's not to say uh, Saudi Arabia was the example, the perfect example of Islam in practice. No? But Islam is being implemented there more so than in many other places and it had that effect on the society. And don't think that, oh, that's just the way things are in Arabia and how it was. No. You go and read the stories of the travelers in Arabia in the early days. People used to come for Hajj mm -hmm. and they had to be, you know, gunmen in, with their caravans to make sure that raiders wouldn't come and catch them and put them into slavery. And you know, yeah, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. It was like the Wild West. There, you know, in times past. But with the changeover, with the establishment of Sharia as the law of the country, you know, applying the law, etc. across the, the, the board, and, you know, uh, promotion of Islam in the society, education in the society towards Islam, etc. It had this, you know, major impact you know, on the society. And again, as I said, it is ultimately you know, taqwa which is at the core of it. And when you look, for example, at the prohibition of alcohol, this is something which all of the major societies recognize as harmful. And America, for 13 years, between 1920 and 1933, they prohibited alcohol. The government, prohibition, they instituted law prohibiting the production and the sale of alcohol for 30, 30, 13 years. But it didn't work. It didn't work. Because the fear of God was not behind it. The consciousness of God was not behind it. So, though many people, the masses of the people, were prevented from being able to consume alcohol, a criminal element developed. This is where Al Capone, 
you know, and the, the famous uh, gangsters of that era, Al Capone was, you know, he yeah. was making like 60 odd million a year from selling illegal alcohol. That was his business. And people, you know, were, who had money, in the upper segments of the society, they would still have access to, to alcohol. So it didn't work. Whereas, Muslims internationally, not to say that it's the case of all Muslims, because there are Muslims who drink and these things too, but as a whole, without the pressure of law, etc., etc., you do find that the mass of Muslims don't drink. They don't drink. Why? Because of this consciousness of God. It has to do with the consciousness of God. And this is what the fast focuses on. Developing that consciousness. We have it to different levels. You know, having been raised or having come into Islam, have been raised as Muslims, whatever. There is a degree of it. I mean, but in, unfortunately in the mass of Muslim countries, that degree is very, very small. And this is what I wanted us to reflect on this evening. To what degree are we really working on this in our fasts? <clears throat> when we look back at last Ramadan and the Ramadan before it and before that, can we see any kind of progression? Or is it just the same thing every year? We did it last year, we did it the year before and before and before. It's just a, an occurrence that happens in our lives every year. This is the thing that we need to reflect on. Because if, if the issues of taqwa were being developed, were being focused on, then we should be growing from Ramadan to Ramadan. There should be a progressive growth in our spirituality, in our character, etc. But if we look at ourselves and ask ourselves seriously, has there been a growth? Do we feel a change? Then we have to admit that really it's just the same old, same old as they say. It's the same thing we're doing each year. So we need to again reflect on the goals and the purposes of Ramadan. And find out what is missing. Well, we know it is something to do with the taqwa, but what is missing which is not allowing taqwa to take its rightful place in our fast? That our taqwa, our fear of Allah, our consciousness of Allah is not increasing. We are not growing with each Ramadan. What is, what is missing? Now, that, what I think, from my observance, in looking at the mode and the method of fasting I feel that to a large degree we are far away from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is, this is the answer whenever Muslims go astray it will be because they have left the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because his sunnah is the way. If we are holding on firmly to that sunnah, then we will be on the right path. We will be getting from the fast what Allah has prescribed for us. Now if we look at the sunnah, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his fast we find that he used to begin the fast suhoor and he emphasized suhoor don't miss it even if it's only drinking a glass of water don't miss it he used to begin the fast with some olives some bread you know barley bread or whatever something very light and when he broke the fast he broke the fast with three dates drank some water he went to pray and following that he would have a moderate meal 
a moderate meal. You can't gain weight in Ramadan doing that. So for us to be gaining weight, then it means we are not doing that. What we find is that the tradition is when we begin the fast, because we know we're going to be fasting for the next so many hours, we don't want to feel hungry. So, we prepare three course meals. You know, we're going into the fast eating, you know, half a chicken and, you know, some, you know, a leg of goat and rice and, you know, biryani or whatever, you know, kabsha, whatever we're just, we just tank up going in. And what happens, of course, is that our systems, you know, overloaded, and I notice in the Emirates where I am, you'd always see before Ramadan comes warnings from the doctors, right? <laughs> to the population, you know, to control their eating. Don't overeat because so many people are coming into the hospitals with, with problems from overeating. Ramadan. <laughs> so, the point is that people, you know, tank up, they go into the fast. What's happening is that the system is just, you know, it's taking time to, 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 to uh, digest this and it's working, and it's working, and it's working. You find that it's working all the way through the day. Maybe only about an hour before uh, sunset. It finally finishes work. Then you have sunset coming. Ah, mashallah, time to break the fast. <laughs> and then when the time comes to break the fast, instead of three dates, you know, some water, you know, or some juice, whatever, and going to pray, no, we pile up in front of ourselves, you know, all these foods, you know, the stuff, very rich stuff with all the sugar and, you know, calories, and, you know, we pile up and, and we eat and eat and eat, and we eat, and we eat, <laughs> until, you know, you reach the point, you say, <laughs> you feel something stuck in your throat, <laughs> you, eat, you can't put any more down, right? That's when you finally have to stop. You stop when you reach that point. And of course, when we go to stand for tarawih, you know, in this state, right, when your stomach is all full like this, you know, you're, you're tired, you get sleepy, you know, you can hardly stay up with your mom and you're looking at your watch, you get, well, hurry up and finish, you know, so, and, and of course, in this way, we gain weight. This is how we gain weight in Ramadan. <coughs> Because we're not following the sunnah. We're not following the sunnah. So, the fast, which on one hand, is to develop a sense of control over our eating habits. Eating, drinking, habits. The sense of control isn't there. Yes, we are not fasting during the daylight hours. But, the real test of control is at the time of the breaking of the fast. This is the time that we're being tested. Have we gained control? Have we learned control? Are we in control? The reality is we're not. Because as soon as that adhan goes, we just let all the reins loose and we're just going for it. There's no control there. There is no control. And when you consider that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said that the believer eats as if he has one stomach and the disbeliever as if he has seven based on that criteria if we were to judge the Muslims today in their fasting their breaking of the fast we would have to say the Muslims are disbelievers we're not eating as if we had one stomach and he said that we should eat a third, drink a third, and leave a third for breathing. Leave a third for breathing, meaning that you never fill your stomach. How many of us can say that we have gone a day without filling our stomachs? Every time we eat, we eat to our fill. This is the norm. This is the way that we eat. But this is not from the Sunnah. And the Prophet ﷺ had said that the worst vessel, the worst container that a person can fill is his or her stomach. It's the worst container to fill. And he had identified the stomach as the source of most illnesses. And 
this is what has medically been shown. Most of the sicknesses and illnesses that people suffer today can be traced back to their eating habits. Back to the stomach. And when he spoke of the signs of the last day, he spoke of things to come that would happen amongst Muslims, whether it is that they will drink alcohol, calling it by other than its name, take interest and call it a different name. He's talking about different things. In Sahih Bukhari, you find him saying, وَيَذْهَرُ فِيهِ مُسِّمًا وَيَذْهَرُ فِيهِ مُسِّمًا There will appear among them, amongst the Muslim, fatsos, fatties, <laughs> big fat people. Not people who have glandular problems who normally, you know, you, doesn't matter, he eats a little bit, he's still getting fat anyway. You know, that's, nobody's held to blame for that. But that Muslims would be known to be fat. They would appear amongst the many. Meaning that you go back in time, you know, the early Muslims and that, you will not see that. It was not the, it was not the norm. It was not the norm. Today it's the norm. You know? And unfortunately, you'll find amongst you know, the religious leaders, the shiuch and so on, so you see that it's normal. You see the sheikh, sheikh means big, right, right. This <laughs> comes to give you this is, this is the norm. But this was not the way. This was not the way of the Muslims. The early Muslims is not known. Because this overeating is indicative of something. It's indicative of a lifestyle which is not in keeping with the, the sunnah. The way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, where we eat enough to keep your back straight, as you would say. You know, not to keep your back straight, you're not you know, bent over from hunger. This was the way. By maintaining this light meal coming into the fast, moderate meal coming out of the fast, a person then experiences hunger. Meaning that in each, in each day of fasting, he or she will feel hungry. Unfortunately today for us, we don't want to feel hungry. And this is why we're eating so much. We don't want to feel hungry. And I remember that, you know, people used to tell me when I first came into Islam, first, you know, year of fasting, you know, they'd ask, how is, how's the fast going, you know, you new Muslim, how's the fast going? Said, yeah. it's difficult, you know, this hunger, I'm not really used to it. They say, well, you know, you don't feel hungry, you know, it's because you're a new Muslim. Eventually, you know, you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we Muslim, we don't feel hungry, right? No, no. <laughs> 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 The point is that the whole issue of hunger is lost. You know, people don't want to feel hungry. But the thing is that feeling hunger, hungry is a part of fasting. We should feel hungry every day. We should feel pangs of hunger. Why? Because in that hunger, and feeling that hunger, it reminds us of those who are hungry, not because they've chosen to fast, but because... They have no food to eat. And this should then motivate us to be generous, to seek out those who are needy and to help them. And this is why we have Eid al-Fitr. The celebration for breaking the fast is one of feeding the poor. This is what is supposed to be generated. This is part of what is generated from the fast. An, an empathy or sympathy for those people who are needy and generosity. This characteristic should be developed in the course of fasting. But unfortunately, we have missed it. And we are not considering that the fast, if somebody, somebody may say to us, so what if I eat, you know, extra you know how does that that doesn't really affect my faith and okay maybe i'm not complying with the letter of the law for the fast but you know my faith i'm still okay the reality 
is that this attitude of overeating is indicative of an attitude towards the dunya. You know, when you really get down to it, this desire to eat the way we're eating is an expression of our general desire towards the dunya. We want to grab as much of it as we can. Because really, you know, this habit, when you look at our habits, they're all interrelated. You're not going to be uncontrolled in your eating habits and then controlled in your other habits. No. It means that we're uncontrolled in general. al takathur. We've forgotten this verse. That this desire to want to grab as much of the dunya as possible has caused them to be unaware of the purpose of this life. That this is what is happening in our lives. That our love for the dunya, our desire to want to get as much of the dunya as possible, this is overwhelming our lives. And naturally, how can one be spiritual in the midst of all that? Where is, where is the role of spirituality in that? Spirituality only develops what is called zuhud. Zuhud is abstinence, control, taking from the dunya what we need, not trying to get all of it. But this is what has happened to Muslims. And so, Muslims will suffer in different parts of the world, whether it's in Chechnya, or it's in Bosnia, or it's in Burma, or in Kashmir, or Somalia, or whatever. Wherever Muslims suffer, we don't find the rest of the Muslim world rising to their aid. Sacrificing, putting aside the dunya and coming to their aid to fight alongside them in defense of Muslim lives and Muslim property. Jihad is lost amongst us. The only jihad we heard was when Saddam, you know, when the Americans were coming for Saddam, and all of a sudden he was talking about jihad. You know. It's a joke. In the Muslim world, jihad is seen as a political statement that leaders will say to promote their cause. It doesn't have the meaning that it had in the times past when Muslims were practicing and the ummah strong. So we have to look at this fast, you know, and its implications because when we speak of taqwa, when we speak of generosity, you know, control, moderation, we, th this is not something unique to Ramadan. This is something which should be throughout our lives. This is why I entitled this presentation, Fasting, A Way of Life. And we can see that from Prophet Muhammad's instructions to us after Ramadan to fast six days of Shawwal, that it has the reward along with Ramadan as fasting the whole year. He used to fast Mondays and Thursdays, three days of the lunar month, 13, 14, 15, certain days in, in the year, Arafah, Ashura, etc. Throughout the year, the different days he fasted also. So that encouragement is fasting continues throughout the year. Reminding us that fasting, as I said, is a way of life. And it should be helping us to grow. But there's an aspect of the fast that we should also reflect on. And that is the, the inner aspect with regards to how we communicate, how we uh, interact with other people. Because we live in societies, and as such, what you find is that it's the norm that people discuss uh, other people, their business, and I mean, we 
sit down with conversation, much of our conversation is involved in talking about other people. Did you hear what so-and-so did? Did you see what so-and-so was doing? So a lot of talking about people. And we find from the Prophet's statements with regards to fasting <coughs> uh, that he said a person who doesn't abandon lies and acting on them during Ramadan Allah will not reward his leaving food and drink Allah has no need for this there is no reward for it مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلْ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً فِي أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَامَةً وَشَرَابَةً This is narrated by Imam Bukhari That in Ramadan we are not supposed to be talking about people spreading rumors about people gossiping, backbiting, all of these kind of things, it destroys the value of the fast. So we end up, as the Prophet you know, had said, رُبَّ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعَ وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا السَّهَرِ Perhaps a fasting person will gain nothing from his fast or her fast but hunger. And perhaps the one who stands up at night for prayer, prayer will get nothing but tiredness. And without this control, this now psychological, this is the psychological aspects of the fasting, where we gain control over what is coming out of our mouths. Because we think the fast is what is going in. You prevent things from coming in your mouth. But actually, fasting involves preventing things from coming out of our mouths also. Very, very important part of fasting. But this control, if it is not there, it destroys the fast. It destroys the fast. destroys the value and the reward from fasting. And this is something which we need throughout the year we need it throughout the year as the Prophet ﷺ told us whoever fears Allah in the last day should either speak good or be silent beware of what we say because as he said also perhaps a person may say something which they think is very small it's nothing but to Allah it is something great and Allah writes it against this individual and he goes to hell because of it. And when we consider to some degree there are elements amongst us who have not restrained their tongues from speaking about others to the point where they have even spoken against the scholars, etc., scholars of Islam we can see that the essence of the fast is missing the spirituality which should be gained from the fast is missing so they become shells externally they appear to be practicing Islam their fast and so on but internally there is a vacuum there so they don't feel any kind of ill or any kind of um, reservation to want to stop themselves from speaking about others rumors spreading gossip considering that the Prophet ﷺ had said لا يدخل الجنة نمام that the gossiper the one who is constantly spreading gossip would not enter paradise so severe so critical but we find Muslims very keen, very anxious to talk about the honor of their fellow Muslim. He's a this, he's a that, he does this, he does that, she does this, she does that. By the fast being destroyed, our whole lives 
are being destroyed. Taqwa is missing. We're not gaining it. And the fast going from Ramadan to Ramadan is not giving us any of the blessings which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. When he said that from one fast to the next, from one Ramadan to the next, erases sins in between. The kind of fast that we're doing erases no sin. The Prophet ﷺ said when, when Ramadan comes, the doors of paradise are open. That meaning a chance to do good deeds which will take us to paradise is there. Allah has given us this chance. But we pass Ramadan through, we have not taken anything from it. And we don't take that opportunity. So much so that we have a, amongst us today the phenomena of what they, of what they call the Ramadan Muslim. Yeah. 11 months of the year, in practice, he's a kafir. He's not praying, he's not praying. But Ramadan comes, you see him in the masjid. You only see him in the masjid in Ramadan. Praying, fasting, everything. The Ramadan Muslim. And I remember being introduced to another concept which was called Jumat al Wuda. <laughs> Jumat al Wuda. What is Jumat al Wuda? I'd never heard about it before. This uh, sister from Pakistan told me about it. She, she said, Zulat um, al-Wida, you know, because I said, I, I knew of Hajj, you know, Hijjat al-Wida, the farewell pilgrimage of the Prophet ﷺ. We have Tawaf al-Wida, you know, the farewell Tawaf when you were making Hajj or Umrah before you leave Mecca. But Jumat al-Wida, she said, well, this Jumat al-Wida, as she had been told, was the, the last Juma in Ramadan. That if you catch that last Juma in Ramadan, it makes up for the whole year of prayers. <laughs> another one. Of course, I had to tell her, of course, there's no such thing. Prophet Muhammad never spoke of such a thing. No Juma till we die. The last Friday of Juma is like any Friday in Juma. Hey, hey, sorry, last Friday of Ramadan is like any Friday. It has no special blessings in that sense. And of course, you know, for those who aren't caught up in Jumat al for them, there is Laylatul Qadr. Okay, it's not much, we have Laylatul Qadr. Right? It's worth a thousand months of worship. But this is true. This is true. This is fact. This is in the Quran. Laylatul Qadr, Khayr min al Fishar. And they took out their calculators, you know, hit the calculators. 83.3 years of worship if you catch Laylatul Qadr. So maybe they don't pray through Ramadan, they just wait for the 27th. This is the night. I will stay up all night in prayer to catch this Laylatul Qadr here. For the life. But of course, we don't know what night Laylatul Qadr is. Prophet informed us, you know, you can seek it in the last uh, 10. It's not precise. We don't know. It varies from year to year. It can vary from year to year. And even you think you are on that night, the 27th, but maybe you started your fast a day early or a day late. And it's not the night you thought. So it's not precise that one night you can catch it. And, and in any case, if we've not been praying all year long, what kind of prayer are you going to make that night? Huh? What kind of prayer can we make that night? You know? This is the mistaken cultural understanding now of Ramadan for us. And so we go from Ramadan to Ramadan. No difference. It hasn't purified us. It hasn't removed any sins. It hasn't increased our faith. We just gained weight. That's all. From one Ramadan to the next, we gain weight. So, I think we need to stop for a minute. We're still in the beginnings of Ramadan. We need to stop for a minute and question ourselves. If this is the fact, if what I've been saying 
is the reality we are all living it then we need to stop here and say hey let me not make the rest of Ramadan the way it's been let me change it because we can change we're not locked as robots into a particular program where we can't change we cannot you know do it in another way Alhamdulillah we have free will we know what is right we've been reminded of what is right then we can do it so I would hope inshallah that all of you and myself would make a new step starting tomorrow for the rest of this month month of fasting that we would try to change and go back to the sunnah to do it in the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and this month because when we look at why it is that Allah chose this month for fasting we find Allah tells us in the Quran شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدن للناس وبينات من هدى that this is the month in which the Quran was revealed clear guidance for people this is the blessed month not the holy month peace, peace people call this the holy month of Ramadan like the holy prophet and the holy Quran please this terminology is Christian terminology you have the holy Bible that's their thing we don't have any holy Quran we have the Quran al Karim, the noble Quran, Al Quran al Azim, the magnificent Quran. We have these terms, but Allah, we never have the, here the Prophet or we hear Allah saying Al Quran al Muqaddas, Al Ard al Muqaddas, talking about you know uh, Palestine, Jerusalem. But no, Quran, no, no holy Quran, no holy Prophet, huh? no holy Ramadan. Please let us stop this. It's a something we have picked up from colonial times when we were ruled by our colonial masters and they were talking about their holy bible we wanted to have something holy also so we made a holy quran and a holy ramadan but the point is that this month this month of fasting chosen by Allah in honor of the revelation of the quran and this is a reminder for us that the quran should be the foundation of our lives not the book that we keep on the highest shelf that we take down during Ramadan we blow off the dust and we sit to read it during Ramadan and we put it back on the shelf for the rest of the year no this book is the book of guidance for us that we should be reading on a regular basis we should be memorizing from the Quran we should be learning Tajweed to recite it correctly. We should be learning the meanings, reflecting on the meanings. When we read the Quran, it should not be just ritualistically, you know, <clears throat> as it has become amongst us. If we were taught to read the Quran, Khatm al Quran, or whatever, as children, so now we read the Quran, we just, you know, our minds can be elsewhere doing all kinds of other things, and, you know, planning for breaking the fast and the foods and the other things that brought our lips are going through the motions of reading the Quran this is not the reading of Quran Allah asks us don't we reflect afalayat in the maroon of Quran you know or are our hearts sealed up Quran is recited to them with a tuliyat alayhim Quran that their hearts become soft, softened. Much of us, many of us, we have lost this. There is no softness to our hearts. The Quran is not touching us, it is not moving us. It's not moving us to tears. The only time we cry, you know, is when our team loses, you know, in a uh, cricket game or soccer or something this is when tears come down our eyes you know how could the team lose <laughs> but for the sake of Allah uh, how many of us experience that in our lives tears coming to our eyes when we reflect on the Quran when we reflect on Allah when we reflect on our sins and our position now where is our humility before Allah 
The reading of the Quran in this month is supposed to help us to develop this. Quran should be the foundation. Without that, then the hearts really, our hearts become hardened. This is why we don't have any difficulty in speaking about other people. You know? Defaming people, dishonoring people. We don't have a problem with it because our hearts have become it plays no longer plays a major role in our lives. So what happens, unfortunately, you will find people will come into Islam newly and instead of people sitting them down, teaching them the Quran, memorize the Quran so you can use it in your prayers and learn Tajweed, read the Quran regularly, so on and so on. So, person comes into Islam and you find people will be drawing them aside and telling them things. You know, either watch out for so and so and so and so and so and so. You know, he's no good. You know, don't listen to his khutbas, don't read his books, don't listen to his tapes. You know, so the person from, he's just coming to Islam and now he's, you know, he's knowing he's, this sheikh is no good. That sheikh is no good. This one is no... He, he becomes an expert on defining who is good and who is not the sheikh and who has knowledge, who has... But you ask him, brother, you learned how to read Quran yet? Oh, no, no, no. Inshallah. <laughs> right. He's become an expert, you know, what they call a jarah wa ta'adil. You know, he knows now. He's a specialist in identifying the good, the specialist. And foundation is completely missing. But there he is talking about people. And then he will speak about, you know, people who may be among the awliya of Allah. He will say statements and he will point fingers at people. When you go and see these people and see them in their own practice of the deen, etc., etc., you know, these people may very well be among the awliya of Allah. Those close friends of Allah that Allah calls his awliya. About whom he said, that if someone harms one of my awliya, I declare war against him or her. That they're bringing upon themselves the war unleashed by Allah on them. Instead of focusing on the foundation of the deen, Building that foundation, learning, establishing that connection with the Qur'an which is guidance, which has in it, as Allah says, a shifa, lima fi sudur, a cure for what is in the hearts, what is in the chest, the, the, the feelings, the, the illnesses, our psychological, our spiritual illnesses, the cure is there in the Qur'an. But we are not taking it. Ramadan goes and the Qur'an goes. We need to get back in touch with our Ramadan. We need to save Ramadan for ourselves, for our own sake. Because Allah has no need for our fasts. Ramadan does not benefit Allah in any way. Ramadan was prescribed for our benefit. If we want it, if we want to go, if we want Islam to have meaning in our lives, then we must establish it in Ramadan. Because Ramadan is the mini, mini, uh, uh, we could say condensed element of Islam. It's, it's been condensed down into Ramadan, packaged in a very tight package, where we have a requirement, all the various things that we have to do throughout the year, it's focused here in Ramadan. If we can't make it in Ramadan, then we're not making it any other time. So we need to re-establish our connection with Ramadan. And in that way, Ramadan becomes, fasting becomes for us a way of life, a way of living. It will affect all of our actions we will grow spiritually we can feel, we will feel something we will come out of Ramadan feeling refreshed we will long for the next Ramadan as 
the Sahaba were described is that they used to long for Ramadan. Well, we don't have that longing. If we do, it's just the longing for the sweets and the whatever, you know. But longing for Ramadan as Ramadan, we've lost it. So I pray that Allah would put in our hearts a desire to make Ramadan real in our lives. That we would spend some time in the morning, in the evening, in the time when we are breaking our fast, the Prophet ﷺ said that the dua which is made at the time of the breaking of the fast is a dua which is guaranteed an answer. Most of us, we don't break the fast again. Let's just eat. We lost. No dua, nothing. And if we manage to get out, you know, Allahumma laka sumtu or the more accurate one, you know, dhahab al dhamma wa abtillat al uruq. We manage to get this dua out. That's it. We're eating. The dua. The dua, ask Allah. I hope and I pray that Allah will give us the tawfiq to, to ask. Use these opportunities for special blessings from Allah in Ramadan to transform our Ramadan into a religious duty with consequence in our lives, which would make us better human beings, better Muslims, and deserving of Allah's mercy and deserving ultimately of paradise.